word had been sent out that there was going to be a distribution of food. And men came as far as 10 miles away with, with bags to gather their food and take it back to their families who were very, very hard up. Julia Hastings, Sidney's wife, in her log cabin over here, block and a half, two blocks, started cooking. And she cooked, and she cooked, and she cooked. Many of the men who had come to get the food had not had a square meal for days and weeks, and they were ravenous. And they ate, and they ate, and they ate. And the lady cooked, and she cooked, and she cooked. <laughs> she may have had some help, maybe other ladies from the town. But it must have been quite a scene, and she just realized that this was her service uh, to the community at that particular moment. Well, the food was distributed, and then Ralph Ely took his transportation barge down to Saginaw and got another load, and L.D. Mosier took his boat down to Saginaw and got another load. Both of these, of course, were crews of men to help bring all this back. Uh, what did they bring back? They brought back barrels of flour, barrels of pork, hams, bags of beans, potatoes, but they were supposed to be used as seed potatoes, uh, boxes of tea, but that was, uh, the priority for tea was people who are sick. Um, those are some of the things they brought. They brought back denim and shirt material because a lot of people were, had no clothes anymore except just rags. They brought back uh, ladies' shoes because many families had only one pair of shoes and that was dad's boots. And if a lady wanted to go and visit another lady, uh, you know, a mile away, she had to wear her husband's boots. Now they were generally interchangeable because only recently had they started making shoes for left and right feet. And so these were clodhoppers, and that's what they used. And so they sent some ladies' shoes uh, so that the ladies would have footwear. Dr. Cheeseman, uh, over in Hamilton Township, took two men with him, took a boat down the Bad River, which comes up into the county on, from the east, went down to the Shiawassee and to the Saginaw and got a load of food and brought it back. They were coming back, it was winter, they got caught in a cold snap, very cold, very suddenly. The Bad River started to form ice. They were desperate to get up to where the food was supposed to go. They kept moving, kept moving until the ice got so thick they couldn't move any further. Very soon they found themselves frozen in. And they knew that it was getting so cold that they were probably going to freeze to death. So they looked and found a, a raft of pine logs lashed together there at the, on the river bank, and they managed to break enough ice to get over on the raft, got some firewood, started to fire, kept it going all night, and that saved their lives. So as that kind of unusual, almost daring, almost heroic kind of activities that were part of the starving time. The county had borrowed $4,000 to buy food, and then they borrowed another $8,000. It was probably around 1857, 58, because people were still needy. And Ralph Ely, who was county treasurer, was, was designated as the purchasing agent to go to Detroit with this money and buy food. And so he went, kind of reluctantly in a sense, uh, to be responsible for this much money, and uh, bought only $1,500 of food. He got enough because with the donated food, it had taken the edge off of the hunger and had alleviated some of the problems because of the people in the metropolitan areas who had been generous. Uh, the county said, find uh, places to have this shipped, and, uh, like depots, not train depots like this, but a spot. So for the western part of the county and the southwestern part, Puwamo. The railroad had reached Puwamo. For the southern part, uh, it was to be St. John's. For the eastern part, St. Charles. And for the northern part, Midland. Because, I mean, that made sense. You go down the river and get it. By that time, things were not as serious. And in 1858 and 59, they had good growing seasons. And finally, by 1859, people had broadened their fields so they might actually be called fields. And the farms, these pitifully small farms, were large enough. So with a good growing season, they were able to grow enough food to last them until the next harvest. 
And boy, was that good news. In 58 and 59, things really improved. By 1860, they not only grew enough food for themselves, it was such a good year, they had a surplus that they could use for bartering or for exporting from the county for sale. That starving time was over. But it was remembered by these pioneers who had truly suffered and by their children who wondered why things were the way they were. And uh, as is the want of people, I guess, to go through our times, you try and forget the sharpness of the hard time. And you're trying to remember maybe only the good parts, if there were any. Well, there were some. And they remembered, uh, in the years later, they remembered how people had to help each other. They were forced into it. Neighbors helped neighbors. Neighbors like, like Cheeseman gave up all his year's worth of food to his neighbors who had none. It was a generosity that people remembered and how people stepped up and did what they considered to be the right thing. Some of these people were heroes. I mean, I, I think John Cheeseman, in giving up all of his food and then having to traipse uh, six miles to get flour, I see him as a hero. I see him as a hero as he goes down to Saginaw and risks life and limb, and very much life, coming back in that winter ice and uh, almost dying. But he was desperate and he was willing to, uh, make, to take that chance. And the men that went down the river system and worked so hard. These are truly heroic men, and they were appreciated. But as people looked at it, they remembered that there were still some good times. Well, for those that had gotten food that had been bought by the county, when they got their food, they had to sign an oath that said something like this. I, John Doe, do swear that the food I am taking is strictly for my family, which is in need, and I am not going to use this for anything else or sell it to anybody. And I will pay back the amount of the food at 10% interest. And uh, payday came, and uh, there were people who were honest, and they paid it back. There were other families that still were in some need, and it wasn't convenient to pay it back, and it was more convenient to kind of forget it. County officers were kind of upset. They said, how are we going to make these people pay their debt? They talked about it off and on for years and session after session, and a few did pay, but a lot didn't. And they said, they even went so far as to consider somehow foreclosing on mortgages that some of these people held. Well, that didn't make much sense. How does the debtor pay his debt if he's in prison? You know, that kind of thing. Amen. And so... <laughs> By 1876, about 20 years later, the county wrote it off. No longer even worth messing with. They even had a new generation coming up. But the people of Gratiot County, those pioneers, when they gathered in their meetings of the Pioneer Society, they remembered in great detail the hard times of starving Gratiot. And that, friends, is the story. Thank you.